The Bible discusses a being, called Lucifer, in both the Old and New Testaments. Other names for this creature are, Satan, and the Devil. One of the first explanations of just who this being known as Lucifer is, is found in the Old Testament, a book, written by the prophet Isaiah, who wrote around 740 BC. He wrote that Lucifer was created full of wisdom, and was perfect. He was created the anointed cherub that covereth the throne of God, and that he actually was upon the holy mountain of God. He later corrupted his wisdom by reason of his brightness. The Bible then records that God cast him to the ground. Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah 14 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Notice that the fall of Lucifer weakened the nations of the world. This will be examined in other video. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Luke, a writer in the New Testament, records in Luke 10:18 that Jesus said that he beheld Satan, Lucifer's new name, as lightning fall from heaven. Peter records in 2 Peter 2 4 that God has spared not the angels who were involved in Lucifer's revolt against God that sinned but cast them down as well. Paul, another New Testament writer, wrote this about Lucifer in 2 Corinthians 11:14 in about 57 AD. And no marvel, for Satan is transformed into an angel of light. And in 2 Thessalonians 2 9, Paul wrote that Satan was capable of working lying wonders. In around 90 AD, John, the author of the book known as Revelation, wrote in Revelation 12 9, that Satan was a dragon. Lucifer shows up in the original site of human habitation on earth, called the Garden of Eden. The Creator, God, placed Adam, the first man, and later Eve, the first woman, in this garden, but told them that there were certain rules that they had to abide by. These are spelled out in Genesis 2 16 to 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Later, Lucifer spoke through a serpent to Eve, but in reality, to both men and women. Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So, from the above information, it is possible to glean a little knowledge about the nature of Lucifer. 1. He was cast down from heaven, because he desired to ascend directly into the seat of heavenly power, the throne of God. 2. He is referred to as the son of the morning. This appears to be a reference to Lucifer being similar to the sun, which also arises every morning. 3. His desire is to sit on the north side of the mountain of God. 4. Lucifer can deceive the world, because he has been transformed into an angel of light. 5. Lucifer can work lying wonders. Now, with those basic understandings of Lucifer in place, it will be possible to examine the views of others about this fallen entity. However, not all agree with a picture of Lucifer being evil. Albert Pike wrote, There is no rebellious demon of evil, or principle of darkness, and an eternal controversy with God. In fact, Mr. Pike believes that Lucifer was not a force of evil, but could be a force for good. He wrote this in Morals and Dogma. For the initiates, those initiated into the true secrets of masonry, this is not a person, but a force, created for good, but which may serve for evil. To further amplify that belief of Mr. Pike's, it becomes important to quote a letter that he wrote on July 14, 1889 to the 23 Supreme Councils of the World. Judging from the contents of this letter, it appears that Mr. Pike was attempting to tell the leaders of the various supreme councils all over the world that they were to know that Lucifer was the secret god of the Masons. This letter clearly indicates that he believed the position that Lucifer was a god who had come to earth for the good of mankind. He wrote, That which we must say to the crowd is, presumably Mr. Pike meant that the crowd was all of the non-Masons, or the public at large, we worship a god, but it is the god that one adores without superstition. It appears that one of the purposes of this letter was to advise all of the top-ranking Masons that they were to concoct a story that the Masons worshipped the traditional God, so that none could ever accuse them of worshipping a cherub, a non-God, by the name of Lucifer. In other words, they were to deny that Lucifer was their God, whenever an outsider was smart enough to break through all of the secrets and figure it out. 
So the secret inside the Masonic order is that Lucifer is their secret god. Any non-Mason today who attempts to explain to any of their Masonic friends or relatives that this is the secret inside the lodge will be met with an instantaneous denial. Every Mason, whether they know the secret of the lodge or not, will obviously deny the accusation. Mr. Pike continued. You may repeat it to the 32nd, 31st and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Here Mr. Pike seems to indicate that it is the 30th, 31st and 32nd degrees that are to be taught the Luciferian doctrine. The direct evidence that the honorary 33rd degree is formally taught that Lucifer is the great architect of the universe will be presented later. But, here, Pike seems to say that, that lesson is to be taught at an earlier degree. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai and his priests calumniate him? Pike makes two incredible statements about Lucifer. 1. He is considered to be a god. And 2. The priests and the rabbis have it all backwards and are all slandering his name. As has been illustrated, the Bible states that Lucifer is nothing more than a fallen cherub. He is not a god. Yet Mr. Pike clearly states that Lucifer is a god. And secondly, those who claim that he is the wicked one are slandering him. Those individuals have it all wrong. Mr. Pike continued. The true and pure philosophic religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. Adonai, also spelled Adonai, is the Hebrew word for God. To show that Pike was referring to the God of the Bible, he wrote this, in his book entitled, Morals and Dogma. Adonai, the rival of Baal and Osiris. As has been illustrated, Osiris is the sun god, and the sun has been shown to be a symbol of Lucifer. Adonai is the rival of Lucifer, both in the Bible and in the writings of Albert Pike. But Lucifer, god of light and god of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the god of darkness and evil. Here, once again Mr. Pike writes that Lucifer and Adonai are rivals and that the religious world has it all backwards. Lucifer is the good god and Adonai is the god of evil and darkness. The author would like to interrupt the narrative to make an observation. That authenticity of that letter by Albert Pike that was just quoted has been questioned by a variety of writers. It has been reported that Mr. Pike made these comments in an encyclical hand carried to the a meeting of 23 Supreme Councils of the World on July 14, 1889 in Paris, France. This author is willing to concede that the only evidence for the contents of this encyclical consists of it being quoted in a book written by Frenchman named A.C. de la Rive, entitled La Femme Eastern Time L'Enfant dans la Rank Maconnerie Universelle. That title translated from French to English means The Woman and Child in Universal French Masonry. A copy of that page that contains that quote and the cover of the book has been supplied to this author by a concerned researcher who had someone locate the book in France for him and make copies of the pertinent pages. The author has read another book that contains the English translation of that encyclical. That book is entitled Occult Theocracy and was written in 1933 by Edith Star Miller. She cites the book by Mr. de la Rive as her source. She obviously believed that the letter was true and contained the actual thoughts of Mr. Albert Pike. In other words, the only source for the letter is a Frenchman who quotes it in his book and not Mr. Albert Pike himself. It must be assumed that Mr. Pike, if he were alive today and was asked whether the letter was his, would deny that he ever wrote such an encyclical, whether or not he had written it. But, the reader is admonished to remember that, if he did indeed worship Lucifer and wrote the encyclical, he would certainly have to deny it. So that answer would tell the researcher nothing. It is the contention of this writer and others who are attempting to decipher the secret symbols of the Masonic order that a small percentage of the Masons know that all of the symbols inside the lodge refer to Lucifer. And it must be remembered that these Masons must of necessity do all that they can to deny that fact. And certainly anyone today who believes that the contents of the letter are a fraud would do all that they could to discredit anyone who said that the thoughts were the actual thoughts of Pike. However, this writer is of the opinion that Mr. Pike did indeed worship Lucifer and is not basing that conclusion on just this one letter. Notice that Mr. Pike has written elsewhere that he considered Lucifer to be the secret god of the Masonic Lodge. So, it is not essential to this writer's position that this encyclical be proven to be valid. It is the author's contention that there is ample evidence from other sources, including from Masons other than Mr. Pike, that the secret god inside the Masonic Lodges is Lucifer. That evidence is available to anyone who cares to locate it. But there is another Mason who knows that Lucifer is the good god of a particular segment of the Masons. Pike's fellow 33rd degree Mason, Manley P. Hall, also felt that this god was a god of good. He wrote in his book entitled, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. 
Sun worship played an important part in nearly all the early pagan mysteries. The solar deity was slain by wicked ruffians who personified the evil principle of the universe. By means of certain rituals and ceremonies, symbolic of purification and regeneration, this wonderful god of good was brought back to life and became the savior of his people. This god who came back to life is not the Jesus of the Bible because Mr. Hull refers to him as the solar deity. He is referring to the death and resurrection of Osiris, covered in detail in the Masonic rituals. Manly P. Hall has further identified Lucifer as the god of some of his fellow Masons. He has written this in his book entitled, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. When the Mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of the living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. Mikhail Bakunin, the Russian anarchist, also addressed this question of evil and good gods. He wrote, The evil one is the satanic revolt against divine authority, revolt in which we see the fecund germ of all human emancipations, the revolution. Socialists recognize each other by the words, in the name of the one to whom a great wrong has been done. Satan is the eternal rebel, the first freethinker and the emancipator of worlds. He makes men ashamed of his bestial ignorance and obedience, he emancipates him, stamps upon his brow the seal of liberty and humanity, in urging him to disobey and eat of the fruit of knowledge. That thought that Lucifer was a good spirit, to whom a great wrong was done, is the basic thought that holds the New Age together, according to Tex Mars, the author of two major books on the subject. He has written. Many New Agers commend Lucifer because, by tempting Eve, he enabled man to evolve toward enlightened knowledge and godhood. Mr. Mars discusses the thoughts of a leader in a mystical organization called the Stell Group, named Ikalil Kuashana. He writes that this New Age leader says that. Lucifer is the head of a secret brotherhood of spirits, the brotherhood is named after Lucifer because the great angel Lucifer has been responsible for the abolishment of Eden in order that men could begin on the road to spiritual advancement. So, there is a basic disagreement about the nature of Lucifer, also known as Satan or the devil. The Bible depicts him as a force for evil, and Mr. Pike and others pictures him as a force for good. But the connection between Lucifer and the ancient mysteries needs to be further amplified. The mysteries had a purpose. To create a superman, one capable of understanding the true nature of the universe and to worship the true God. W. L. Wilmshurst, a Mason, wrote these thoughts in his book entitled, The Meaning of Masonry. This, the evolution of man into superman, was always the purpose of the ancient mysteries, and the real purpose of modern masonry is, not the social and charitable purposes to which so much attention is paid, but the evolution of those who aspire to perfect their own nature and transform it into more godlike quality. He amplified this thought a little later in his book. Man who has sprung from the earth and developed through the lower kingdoms of nature to his present rational state has yet to complete his evolution by becoming a godlike being and unifying his consciousness with the omniscient to promote, which is and always has been the sole aim and purpose of initiation. No higher level of attainment is possible than that in which the human merges in the divine consciousness and knows as God knows. So, just as Satan tempted mankind with the ability to know good and evil themselves just like God, without his assistance, now the Masons are teaching that they too could become a god through an initiation into the ancient mysteries. John Anthony West, in his book, Serpent in the Sky, wrote this in support of Mr. Wilmshurst's statement. Egypt started with the concept of divine attributes within man. The gods are not brought down to earth, rather man is raised to the gods. Others besides the above-mentioned Masons, like Louis Kuerbach, have joined the discussion with similar thoughts. He was a 19th-century philosopher and a hero of the communists like Karl Marx. In fact, Frederick Engels, the co-worker with Karl Marx during the time Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, wrote this about his friend. All the communists of 1845 were followers of Feuerbach. The reason that the communists supported the ideas of Kuerbach is apparent when the student reads his writings, he wrote. Man alone is our God, our Father, our Judge, our Redeemer, our true home, our law and our rule, the Alpha and Omega of our life, and of our political, moral, public and domestic activity. There is no salvation, save through the medium of man. John Denver, the well-known popular singer, has adopted this same philosophy about his divinity. He has been quoted us, saying this after his new conversion. It's the single, most important experience of my life, I can do anything. One of these days, I'll be so complete I won't be human, I'll be a god. Mr. Hull, the Mason, stated a similar thought when he wrote this in his book entitled, Lectures on Ancient Philosophy. 
We may study the star intellectually, but we have never attained consciousness until we are the star. But this idea, that man could become a god, is not new. The Bible anticipated it, and Isaiah wrote about it, back in 741 BC. This is what he wrote in Isaiah 43:10. Thus saith the Lord, Understand that I am he. Before me there was no god formed, neither shall there be after me. And once again, in Isaiah 45, 5. I am the Lord, and there is none else, there is no God beside me. The Bible teaches that there is but one God, and that mankind has no possibility of sharing his Godhead. One who apparently has not believed those statements in the Bible is Shirley MacLaine, who has become a spokesman for the position that man can become a God. She has written several books on the subject of her support of the New Age, Newsweek magazine described her as the New Age evangelist. She wrote the following statement in her book entitled, Dancing in the Light. We are part of God, and this elsewhere in the same book. If one says audibly I am God, the sound vibrations literally align the energies of the body to a higher attunement. If each man is a God, mankind is capable of making decisions for their own welfare. Each man has complete control of his decision-making, according to Ms. McLean. In fact, man's control has extended into areas few have ever claimed for mankind. These are the thoughts of Ms. McLean. I think we choose to be together. We choose our parents, and I think the parents choose the children they want to have before they ever come into an incarnation. She went on further to record another strange thought when she wrote this. There was no such thing as reality, only perception. One can only wonder where Miss McLean got these bizarre thoughts from. Several clues that can assist the student in understanding her have been given by either her own revelations or from some articles that have appeared about her in the media. In her book entitled, Out on a Limb, she wrote about her meetings with her married lover in her apartment. She commented that he looked at her shelf of books on, amongst other subjects, Marxist theory, including a biography of Karl Marx. Parade magazine of December 18, 1988, had an article on Miss McLean, in which it revealed that her den had lots of framed pictures, surely with communist Fidel Castro and with communist Nikita Khrushchev amongst others. The magazine reported how Shirley and her lover, talked about democratic socialist principles and how it was possible to have them both at the same time if the rich would only share their wealth more. Elsewhere in her book, she wrote about how much of a hypocrite she was when she added this contradictory statement. Wanted to talk to him, her lover, about how I had made a lot of money and that it made me feel elite in a world that was broke to know I could buy just about anything I wished for. However, nowhere in her book did she say that she had freely donated any of her own wealth to the relief of the poor, apparently she believes that the communist ideas about wealth sharing are acceptable only as long as she does not have to share her wealth like she wants the other rich to do. Miss McLean has since gone on a nationwide tour promoting her newfound religious views to the public. Newsweek magazine reported in 1987 that she had made a great deal of money explaining her new thoughts to others. Since McLean began her tour in January, 1987, more than 10,000 people in 15 cities have paid the $300 admission fee. 10,000 times $300 equals $3 million. Obviously, Shirley's tours have proven to be both popular and lucrative. The Newsweek article on her seminar mentioned a little of what she teaches in them. The following are a few of her comments. The earth is moving off its axis, she says, and only the collective consciousnesses of mankind can write it. For the spiritually inclined, a window of light will appear on those days, August 16 and 17, 1987, that McLean says will allow us to rise to a higher plane of cosmic understanding. Evangelist McLean became Dr. McLean when she reported some of her new cures for two of the world's most serious medical problems, AIDS and cancer of the abdomen. According to the Newsweek article, she told her audience, they, those who paid to hear her in the 15 cities on the tour, all got to hear McLean's pronouncements on such subjects as AIDS. She thinks sufferers are sick because they have been bereft of love necessary to sustain the balance of health and cancer. For cancer of the abdomen, she advises putting patients in a yellow room because yellow is the color frequency of that part of the body. And to think her patients only have to pay $300 for such wisdom. But Dr. McLean is not as dumb as one might think. The Newsweek magazine article reported. Everyone who attended had to sign waivers absolving the seminar's organizers from responsibility for psychological injury. So someone in charge of arranging her seminars is aware that her ideas might cause psychological damage to those attending, and they have moved to protect her from malpractice lawsuits. Not only was this New Age evangelist making money on her personal lecture tours, she was also making money on her best-selling books. 
As of July, 1987, her book entitled, Out on a Limb, had sold 3 million copies, and her other major seller, Dancing in the Light, had sold 2.2 million. Time magazine reported that her five books on self-exploration and self-promotion have run to more than 8 million copies. It appears as if selling the New Age religion can be very profitable. But, in summary, perhaps the most cogent comment about the battle between the New Age and the Christians was made by Nesta Webster in her book entitled, Secret Societies. The war now begins between the two contending principles. The Christian conception of man reaching up to God, and the secret society conception of man as God, needing no revelation from on high and no guidance, but the law of his own nature. And since that nature is in itself divine, all that springs from it is praiseworthy, and those acts, usually regarded as sins, are not to be condemned. The battle lines are drawn between those who believe in a creator God, and those who believe that man can become God. These are the two opposing positions. And the battle between them has begun. This was everything inside me channel. Please like, drop a comment, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the notification bell too. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and healthy.